Welcome all to the first episode of a new series I've been wanting to try out, the What Went Wrong series. In these videos, I want to take a more narrative approach to the rise and fall of some of the most popular fighters on the planet. Today's feature will be on Tony Ferguson. Because of the way I end this video, I'm going to put my spiel at the start. If you like this video or any of my other previous ones, please consider liking. It helps us immensely with the algorithm and this baby took a ton of work to put together. Also, if you are so inclined, please consider supporting us on Patreon in the link above. I'm working on putting out a ton of awesome content for patrons that you don't want to miss out on. Through this video, I hope to be able to answer what led to his rise, why did he fall, and could he have changed something to alter this trajectory. This has probably been the longest production I've ever done on a video. I have written and rewritten this script four times now, so I'm hoping this is the one. All three of the others ended dour, and I hated the way they made me feel afterwards. This one I feel I have found the sweet spot. It's important to note that because of the sheer damage Tony inflicts, I will have to be careful with some of the clips and images I use in this breakdown to avoid breaking YouTube's rules. I have structured this video into three sections, styled after Christopher Nolan's Batman trilogy. Nolan used dumb naming conventions, Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, and then The Dark Knight Rises. Bleh. We shall correct his mistake and finally answer the age-old question, who is the superior content creator, Nolan or myself? We will start off with The Darth Knight Rises, then transition to the Darth Knight section, and then finally the Darth Knight Falls. With that out of the way, we will take all the contextual knowledge we have gained, study the fights for Gechi, Oliveira, and Dariush to see if the signs were there earlier or if these fights were aberrations. And so we begin with the Darth Knight Rises. To start off, you the viewer will have to leave your preconceptions of Tony at the door. Tony in his early career is fairly dissimilar to the Tony you will come to expect. In this section I will outline what he is and isn't early in his career as to sow the seeds for the future. So let's start off with his striking offense. Tony's offense is largely predicated on lead hand strikes, namely a signature half jab half uppercut and a looping hook. All in all, Tony may be the most flow state style striker I have ever studied. What I mean by this is that Tony doesn't use traditional combinations all that often. He instead reads and reacts near universally to what his opponents give him. This is good and bad, and throughout the analysis we will see the pros and cons of this approach. Normally in my videos I use data to mine a bit deeper into fighters like say Cyril Gan to identify his key combos and strikes to contextualize him as a fighter. Tony is not a fighter I can do this with. Like I said, Tony doesn't throw traditional combos very often and his offense is focused around using volume strikes that he decides to throw on a moment's notice to overwhelm opponents with volume and ideally land sneaky strikes around their guard. All of Tony's early knockouts come in this flavor. Tony mainly rolls punches and then throws counters from unexpected angles. He doesn't always land precisely, but what he lacks in precision he makes up for in deception. The odd angles create opportunities for glancing surprise strikes that have a tendency to stun opponents when they least expect it. In my analysis, Tony seems to have roughly average punching power, which I attribute to the stances in which he throws his strikes. Going forward throughout this video, I will refer to a mind palace. This is an allusion to one of the greatest novels of all time, The Silence of the Lambs. Dr. Hannibal Lecter was able to maintain photographic memory recall by creating within his mind a palace where he deposited memories of importance. More concretely, keep this concept in the back of your head. Put this in your mind palace sounds cooler though. So we have a general picture of Tony and his style of offense. Tons of volume and odd angles to launch said volume. On the defensive side, and most important for our projections, Tony's defensive liabilities. These come in two main points with subpoints beneath. First, Tony is very limited in his technical striking defensive fundamentals. He tends to hang his chin in the pocket on hooks and lift it high on uppercuts. Secondly, Tony's footwork is abysmal. Defensively, he lacks any feel for pocket exits and gets caught there often. Offensively, he is subpar at pressure footwork, which is incredibly important for a fighter of his style. Watch tape of Piotr Jan to see what great pressure footwork looks like. All of this adds up to a fighter that resembles a poor man's dominant cruise with Conor McGregor's poor pocket exit footwork mixed in. This analogy is the key to understanding early career Tony prior to him truly ascending to his status as the Darce Knight, as you probably know him as. Because of the way Tony strikes, just like with Cruz, opponents do not fear sitting in the pocket with him and trading strikes. Those deceiving angles come at the cost of being able to fully leverage his strength to power shots through. 
There is a reason strikes are generally thrown a certain way. It maximizes the force you can put behind them. Like Cruz, Tony's deceptive and unorthodox angles create openings for strikes, but they land with limited power as previously stated, and also open him up to non-stun knockdowns because he is off balance in the stance. Cruz too gets knocked down without getting stunned because of his off balance stance. If you land hard on them while they are imbalanced, it is easy to score a knockdown. However, unlike Dom, Tony has a higher level of inherent punch power, so those deception strikes land harder and lead to early career knockouts. To address the last point of my comparison, Tony, like Connor, has incredibly poor and non-technical pocket exit footwork. He has a common tendency to fully turn his back to opponents, and also severely overextends in the pocket. When coupling this with his poor chin fundamentals, he is there to be hit and knocked out. Essentially, if Tony throws enough weird strikes in the pocket, most opponents are going to get tagged, or they'll relent and leave the pocket before Ferguson has a chance to land, while conversely removing their own chance to land on his open chin. But what if they don't exit and fight with better range management than Tony does? Now we have progressed to the first pivotal fight in Tony's career, against Eve Edwards. Eve shows the opportunity I have been mentioning, but is never able to take advantage due to numerous factors. Tony's reach advantage really makes it hard, when coupled with his deceptive volume strategy, for an opponent who doesn't do a particularly effective job of fighting long. Eve shows the door to counter Tony, but doesn't have the skill set to open said door. Enter Michael Johnson, who I will refer to as MJ for short. Eve fights somewhat defensively rather than committing to strikes and extending through them like MJ does. In my original script, I wrote a whole paragraph about how MJ has a longer reach than Eve and how that is the difference. Then I looked, and the only measurable difference between the two is a single inch in height, exact same reach. Watch the two fights and tell me they look like they have the same reach though. I am not doubting the measurement, but rather the way each fighter fights, which really shows how reach differences are more often about style than actual measurements. MJ fights long, Eve fights short. MJ makes the same reads Eve made, but his fighting style allows him to much more effectively take advantage of it. When coupled with MJ's power advantage over Ferguson, we see a Tony we have never prior seen. One of Tony's solutions to his defensive issues he develops early in his career is to fight just out of kicking range. He seems to be baiting entry so he can roll and throw from odd angles. The Johnson fight is the best exemplar of this. Ferguson spends most of the first two rounds attempting to enter the pocket from kicking distance. This leads to him looking like he's fighting out of neutral gear and never actually resembling the action fighter we know and love. The biggest thing that MJ does is his developing read for how Tony wants to enter the pocket specifically with leg kicks, which MJ eats and loads a power too that he repeatedly lands over and over. This further dissuades Tony until the third round, where he sort of just decides to bite down on the mouth guard and go all in, leading to a clear stun and eventual decision loss. Add this counter to your mind palace. Tony likes to use step-in leg kicks from out of range that allows fighters with good boxing fundamentals like Johnson to counter with a power straight or a two in boxing. This moment marks the inflection point of Tony's early career. It is obvious that he now realizes he needs to start developing either his defensive fundamentals or he needs to add weapons to his arsenal to cover for his defensive flaws. He doesn't immediately pull them together, but he starts experimenting as I will now cover. In my notes, I consider the Johnson fight as the main inflection point of the Dark Knight Rises section, leading to the Dark Knight Rises part two now. So we have identified the early issues in Tony's game and shown how fighters can exploit them. For most fighters, this is the end of their career. Adaptability is paramount to long careers in MMA. If Tony is to continue, as we in the future know he will, he will need to figure out adaptations to cover these holes in his game. Unsurprisingly, Tony steadily figures out his solutions over the next few fights. As we talked about before, one of the key pressure valves opponents can turn to in order to defend against Tony's striking arsenal is to attack takedowns on those hooks he wings. Against Rio and Trujillo, Tony finishes the development of his main tactical strategy for punishing opponents that use takedowns, submissions, specifically the Darce Choke. Tony uses the Darce, the namesake of the Darce Knight, to punish rush takedown attempts by sprawling them and using his incredible arm reach to quickly lock up the choke. His savant-like ability to find and lock in the choke is what truly differentiates him from others who wish to use this strategy. For a little extra added context. I have described before how Dustin Poirier uses guillotines as a similar strategy. However, Dustin's guillotine is a less effective solution because if it fails, he is in bottom guard in a controlled position. If Tony fails, he is in a top control position that he can easily get up from. 
Ferguson leverages his exemplary wrestling skills to employ one of the best sprawls I have analyzed in MMA. Notice the athletic fluency that Tony is displaying in some of these sprawls. This is the difference maker when paired with the natural feel for the submission and arm length. All of this comes together in a tremendous secondary weapon to combat adaptations to his pressure striking game plan. But something is still missing, the primary weapon for defense. If a fighter chooses not to attempt a takedown and instead hang in the pocket or even clinch up with him, Tony has not yet developed a weapon for dissuading this. If you caught my foreshadowing, you know where I'm going with this. The best way to show the evolution of Tony into his final form is to go fight by fight here on out with summaries at the end analyzing each fight as a whole. So let's first start off with Josh Thompson. In the first, Tony is using a ton of kicks, mainly teeps and leg kicks. In many of them, he uses a heavy windup to land with incredible power, over and over. Tony is trying to pressure Thompson to the cage, but isn't sure just yet how to capitalize on it. Tony is landing with great volume and not taking much damage in return, so he finishes the round up 10-9 on my scorecard. But now, the grand inflection point of his career, and a literal content warning precedes the start of this round. The final emergence of the Darth Knight occurs at around 3.57 in the second round. Tony grabs onto both of Thompson's hands and drags him towards himself while ripping them down and throwing a killer elbow right to Josh's skull. The bleeding begins immediately and graphically. Thompson was heavily stunned by the blow and immediately falls to his knees. Tony jumps hard on the opportunity and assumes top control. Tony begins to use an alternating grounded uppercut and then throws an elbow to the opposite side of the head on the backswing. Thompson and Tony eventually separate and Thompson is absolutely worse for wear after this sequence. It's important to highlight this concept as we now have concrete empirical evidence of the importance of Tony's elbows. Thompson is absolutely shaken by the damage from that elbow. He doesn't fight scared, but my brain keeps telling me he is thinking more than reacting and following his strategic training. This is a major problem for Thompson and plays right into Tony's hands. That damage is psychological on top of physical. Again, Thompson is not mentally weak or anything. His reaction is completely natural when you get elbowed on the hairline and have a 3-5 to five inch gash bleeding profusely from it. You better believe he is concerned about future elbows from Tony. You know when you see a mosquito in your house, apartment, condo, and you just start getting itchy all over? Phantom mosquitoes is always what I have called it. Thompson and every other Ferguson opponent from here on out gets phantom elbow itches after that strike. At 211, Tony lands another strike that is somewhere between a glancing punch and a swiping elbow. Either way, another massive gash with immediate bleeding. Thompson is stunned and reeling again. Tony jumps on his back but overcommits, and Thompson is able to get into a control position. Tony sets up a triangle choke and uses the position to rain absolute fire and brimstone elbows onto Josh's head. The round finally ends with a bang, and Josh looks like he lost a fight with a bear. At this point, Josh is down clearly 2 to nothing, and he needs a strategy to win while also minimizing further damage. I identify two options, and Thompson utilizes both of them. Josh needs to either start shooting technical takedowns to try and set up submissions and control, or he needs to battle in the pocket at a safe enough distance, a la Michael Johnson, to try and knock out Tony. Unfortunately for Josh, whenever he enters the pocket, Tony slams front kicks, teeps, and off-tempo jabs that lean cleanly on Josh's face. As these exchanges continue, Tony begins to grab the hands to elbow from this sort of half clinch position you see on screen now. We see two major examples in the third at 345, and again five seconds later. Conversely, when Josh lands his takedowns, Tony uses unorthodox escapes and traditional submission attempts to put Josh in compromising positions, which Tony uses to flow state more elbows onto Josh's head. This leads to Josh having no answer to Tony's riddle. Josh wills himself across the finish line, but this was an absolute bludgeoning that ended Josh's career as told by him in his podcast with Big John that I have linked to in the description below. If interested, definitely check that part out. It is truly harrowing what happened to Josh in the minutes after the bell rang there. But back to Tony, unfortunately he is still hanging his chin, getting his kicks checked at an incredibly high rate, and displaying little to no development in his pocket exit footwork. In the end though, it doesn't matter. Yet. The elbow and the damage it causes unlock the best aspects of Tony's unorthodox arsenal. The elbow essentially solves the Dom Cruz dilemma I mentioned before. Now opponents cannot hang in the pocket content to chip away at his hanging chin, because Tony's going to reach out and grab you, and then elbow you into permanent facial scarring. 
Tony's strategy has solidified now. Let's keep going to see how it changes over time and to see if he covers for the holes I've outlined, plus some others that begin to come up. Next up, kicking savant Edson Barbosa. The Barbosa fight immediately shows Tony's recognition of just how dominant his pressure game can be after the decimation of Thompson. Barbosa naturally has a tendency to wilt under pressure. Tony was one of the first to reveal this issue in Barbosa's overall game. Barbosa is a fantastic kicker, but if you deny him the space to get the kicks off, you limit his most elite weapons and limit him to being, in my opinion, an average boxer. Edson doesn't effectively create space on his exit and just sort of side saddles his way from the exterior of the cage back to the center. Fighters like Gaethje took advantage of this by looping a hook to the location Edson was heading towards. Tony again shows that he lacks some of the fundamental pressure footwork skills, but makes up for it in his perfectly tuned power arsenal. Edson is able to stun Tony early, leading to Tony Imanari rolling into Edson at 437. Edson is stuck in a horrible position and is given essentially a binary choice. Posture up to try and muscle himself out of the sub attempt while opening himself up to the elbows of Ferguson, or lean back to avoid strikes while neutralizing his ability to escape and may lead to Tony finishing the submission. Unfortunately, Tony chooses option C, let go of the submission and throw an illegal upkick to a grounded opponent. The fight stops for some time to let Edson recover as he was very obviously stunned by the strike. Time passes. We see a few glimpses where Edson perfectly times counters to Tony's entrances and lands with great effect. Edson is one of the first fighters post Johnson to really put tape out there of how to best counter Tony. Edson shows some cracks in the Darth Knight's mask. If you can maintain effective striking distance or create defensive angles, Tony's chin is still there to be hit. Hard. Defensive angles are a major key and need to be added to our collective mind palace, right next to our exhibit on Michael Johnson's range management counter 2. Let's quickly analyze those angles to add some context to them. One of the most effective means of countering Tony's pressure is to exit laterally from the pocket when he comes in with blazing pressure. This is built off the fact that Tony has mediocre pressure footwork. If you can exit laterally on Tony and line up counters, that hanging chin is there to be smashed. Now back to the fight. The first ends and we get another foreshadowing of what is to come with another viewer discretion advised banner. It takes Tony all of 25 seconds in the second to land a vicious elbow that slices and very clearly stuns Edson. Barbosa shows the same issue Thompson demonstrated post initial elbow. They are just so stunned by the mix of visceral and concussive damage that they sort of just drop all strategy. If this is not the best example of everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, then I don't even know what is. Edson is a different fighter post elbow. All that counter activity is gone. He is constantly moving backwards linearly rather than the proven more effective lateral exits, and is trying to create space for a power kick. He has become incredibly one-dimensional. Tony just walks him down, and an exhausted Edson attempts a panic takedown and is mercifully darsed to a second round loss. Another great example of our early breakdown, and more fuel to the fire that the elbow was the key. That one elbow completely changed Edson in this fight. Next up is a really fascinating case study that I always use as my MMA hipster car to show people I know something special. So here's the take. Lando Venata fights Tony the best of any opponent throughout his entire peak post elbow of Thompson and prior to Gaethje. But he only does it for about three minutes. I'm not saying he is the best opponent, but rather his style is the most effective versus Tony. I'm for sure going to make a breakdown of Venata one day and call it something like unrealized potential because this fight blew me away enough hyperbole. The beginning of this fight cleanly demonstrates the binary for us. Lando's footwork and head movement leave Tony in fits trying to land with any consistency. In fact, Tony does not land a single true slicing elbow in this entire fight. On the flip side, Lando gets dropped by one of Tony's jabs and shows us that his chin is not good enough to hang in the pocket with Tony, even without the elbows. Lando has crisp pocket exit footwork and head movement for the first three minutes and authors a masterpiece work. How to Defend Against Tony Ferguson, a retrospective by Lando Venata. But the tides turn. Lando is beginning to get tired. A mix of body work from Tony and the somewhat inefficient amount of movement on Lando's part are wearing on his gas tank. The story could sort of end here for Tony. When tying together the film from the early portions of the last two fights, specifically Edson and Lando's defensive footwork strategies, we are really building a ton of tape for future opponents to use on Tony. Like with Michael Johnson, a how-to guide is being written on how to combat Tony's volume, but just like last time, Tony adapts. 
More importantly, unlike last time, he does it in real time during the fight. It would be easy for me to look at the two previous fights and call Tony a bit of a one-trick pony. Land facial damage, affect the mentality of your opponent, throw massive volume, repeat, repeat, repeat until their gas tank is depleted and you submit them. But this fight was different. As Lando begins to lose his crisp head movement, Tony starts just picking away patiently at range with his jab, steadily damaging Lando's nose, reducing his gas further. Over and over throughout the second, Tony is content to just beat Lando into submission with his lead hand work. Lando begins hanging his chin more and more while keeping his hands at his sides. He's trying to win a war of attrition with the king of wars of attrition in El Kukui. It goes about as well as you expect. Tony uses what has become and is now solidified as his concrete grappling strategy. Sprawl on the panic takedown. Grab a front headlock. If standing, snap them down to the ground. When grounded, wrap the dars. Rinse, repeat. His secondary weapon is now mastered with this fight. It's important to note that Lando absolutely has some moments in this fight post the three minute mark. At 1.12 of the first, Lando has a perfect sequence that he uses to stun and absolutely nearly finish Tony, again demonstrating Tony's defensive liabilities. Lando catches Tony's body kick, uses his offhand to frame Tony's head power side, throws a gorgeous head kick that lands cleanly on his framed head. Tony is absolutely shaken by this, worse than I have seen him get shaken in his entire career up to this point. But in the end, Tony beat Venata. Venata was a test for Ferguson and he made Tony work to get that victory but it's another fantastic feather in Tony's cap. Just because he didn't blaze through Venata doesn't mean that he is slipping. Just the opposite is true. Tony is showing he can adapt better in real time to his opponent's tactics and fight his fight. Next up, and what I consider the mountaintop of Tony's peak, is his fantastic fight with Rafael Dos Anjos. I will shorten it to RDA from here on to save me some breath. RDA is coming fresh off a loss to Eddie Alvarez for the undisputed lightweight title. So a win here puts RDA and Tony right into a title fight. Starting off in the first round, Tony continues his usual strategy of feeling out the first to look for openings to exploit in later rounds. RDA is doing a really good job maintaining his range on Tony and punishing Tony's leg kicks with the correct response of power straights right to the chin. This also marks the end of the most devastating effects of Ferguson's elbows. He still lands them, but not to the same degree as when he was landing them on Barbosa and Thompson. They still remain a weapon for him, but they are not the game changers they once were, leading to the early holes in his game re-emerging in spots. RDA figures out the counter, and every fighter from here on exploits it. Tony's main elbow tactic is to reach out and grab the opponent's high guard while simultaneously pulling it down and towards him. Once in range, he slices horizontally with the elbow. RDA immediately drops his guard on every reach by Tony, nullifying the tactic and putting on tape the counter every fighter after him will utilize. The most important aspect of the first round is the way that RDA is countering elbows, his counter to Tony's leg kicks, and his maintenance of his fighting range. The round ends after some technical groundwork with RDA up 10-9 on my card. The second starts and Tony's batteries are charged and ready. He immediately starts fighting downhill on RDA, leveraging pressure and volume to pick away at RDA's lead leg and chin. Herb misses an incredibly clear eye rake by Tony, which does some serious visual damage, but it's unclear how much it actually affects RDA in the fight. RDA continues to shoot takedowns to little benefit. Halfway through the round, and Tony is clearly on top. Tony's leg kicks are landing to strong effect, and he is perfectly timing the front kicks to the body. Another point of foreshadowing for the future, and further reinforcing my points on Tony's footwork, is the following sequence. At 104 of the second, where Tony throws a lead hook without setting it up with a step in, he proceeds to carry his foot through with the momentum into a stance switch while throwing what starts off as a rear hook to the chin that lands hard on RDA and stuns him. Honestly, this is truly terrible footwork, but it didn't matter at all because it worked. Even worse, he ends up completely square to RDA and whiffs two punches before pressuring RDA to the fence. This is again the gamble of Tony Ferguson's game solidified. What he is doing is technically impractical, but it works because of a mix of athleticism and deception. Tony's naturally quick hand speed, unorthodox throwing angles, and long reach give him the ability to land that stunning punch, and RDA is too jumbled to react technically to it. In the end, Tony clearly wins this round. Tony again starts round three like his hair's on fire and just lands power volume on RDA. At 409, we see RDA take advantage of the huge hole in his game, which is the turnaround defense. 
through the 330 mark, Tony gets fancy with some elbows, but never lands them cleanly or glances and slices because RDA's shell is too solid. Tony takes his foot off the gas a little before the 2 minute mark, allowing RDA to land some, but it feels a little late in the round that Tony is clearly leading. However, as the round progresses, RDA continues to build momentum and really puts the round in jeopardy for Tony. At about 17 seconds left in the round, RDA lands a hard, solid jab to the hanging chin of Tony. Tony is able to eat the damage, but it absolutely made serious impact on him. In fact, Tony doesn't attempt a single strike for the rest of the round. I give the round to Tony, but would not begrudge someone a 10-9 RDA card. The fourth round starts with a noticeably more tentative Ferguson. The tables turn a minute in when Tony lands a power knee to the chin on a plum clinched RDA. RDA is absolutely feeling the damage here. Tony attempts an Imanari roll at 318, but I'm not really sure tactically why. Probably just a Tony thing. It's clear two minutes in that the leg of RDA is really getting toasted. This negates one of my earlier points that RDA needs to rip twos back at Tony when he telegraphs the low kick. The problem is that RDA's leg health isn't there to power through anymore the way he was earlier. The war of attrition is turning in Tony's favor once again. The most success RDA is having now is rear hook counters going second on Tony's jab or lead uppercut. A little note, Tony's right lat is looking terrible due to damage. At 231, RDA lands another power body kick to it. It's starting to look like the damage from Reyes versus Blachowicz. This is sort of an example of the bad technical defensive shell fundamentals that form the three key holes I identify in Tony's game, but it won't bear much fruit to dive deep on that at this moment. At 55 seconds left, he literally twirls and rips a body punch that he read upon exiting the twirl. If I haven't made my point clear enough yet, this is why there's no point to doing combo data like I did with Sogan. Tony is a flow state striker through and through. I think it's Tony 10-9 by a smidge here. The combined damage from the power jabs and leg kicks leave RDA a shell of his countering self from the first round. Tony comes out downhill again and is grinding out the war of attrition victory. At the end of this fight, I consider Tony to be at his all-time peak. Athletically and technically, this is the best fight I have seen from him against the most broadly talented opponent he has faced, or will face, until Gaith G. RDA had opportunities, but Tony negated them, and at one point the windows just closed on those openings, and RDA gutted out the finish. But now, like all peaks, it is downhill from there. I rate RDA as his peak because of a mix of fighters figuring out how to defend the elbows and the pileup of knee injuries he has sustained throughout his wrestling and MMA careers up to this point, with the most emphatic and damaging to this point being his knee surgery prior to the Kevin Lee fight. I think it is important to highlight the Kevin Lee fight in the greatest detail as it is the best representation of the decline and looking back from the future it is obviously the main area of tape Oliveira and Benil use to form their game plans. I will quickly cover Cowboy and Pettis at a high level because the fights were not very influential to my overall thesis in my opinion. I am skipping Chandler entirely because I don't see anything new in that fight and the video is long enough as is. One last piece of context is an admission. I can't tell if it's his knees and hips or knees and back that are shot. His knees are for sure shot, but the creakiness I will come to identify in Ferguson can't be just knees alone in my opinion. The injuries take their most noticeable toll in his strike and takedown defense. Both are better seen narratively by going sequence by sequence in the Kevin Lee fight. So let's start off with Kevin Lee, see the end of the peak of Tony's professional career as a lightweight in my analytical opinion. I think it's best to use empirical evidence to make my prior point about the toll injuries have waged on Tony. The way I do these videos is I watch his fights in succession multiple times. As such, it is easier for me to see the speed and flexibility degradations in Tony's athleticism that are less apparent watching his career unfold in real time. What I notice consistently is his greater and greater difficulty avoiding strikes with his dips and pulls that he compensates for by pulling his chin higher to eke out some extra space. The first 20 seconds of Kevin Lee are a good example of this. Kevin throws a 1-2 high kick that barely gets slightly blocked by Tony's right hand. Otherwise, it would be full-on contact with the back of Tony's head. Tony has always had bad exit footwork, and over time he has started to rely more and more on taking a single step back from his stance, i.e. if he's in orthodox, he'll step back into southpaw, or vice versa. This combo relies on that tendency, but works better from the reverse stance so that Lee can land his kick directly on Tony's chin. Either way, Tony looks noticeably creakier here. Kevin lands a nasty 1-2 on to Tony by sitting right at a distance he can land at, but Tony feels safe at. 
I know this is the section where his peak is falling off, but his technique is absolutely still improving with regard to his punches and counter hooks. He honestly looks great in this regard in this fight, and is one of the major keys to his victory. Lee wraps a body lock on Ferguson that he uses to ground him for a takedown. Tony nearly reverses him, but Kevin uses technical, sprawl maneuvers to regain his control position. At 210, Tony locks in a 10th planet position that I cannot say to avoid being demonetized. He uses it to land some minor damage to Kevin. Kevin pulls out the back, and Tony transitions to a straight arm lock with a sort of omoplata-like positioning. Kevin easily reverses by spinning around to get his shoulder and arm out of danger. Tony is now in a dangerous side position that is hard for him to defend against the power knees that Lee is throwing back his way. Tony makes the right choice and pulls out to guard with one butterfly hook locked in. Lee and Ferguson put on an absolute scrambling showcase with Lee eventually ending up in top mount. Lee is not able to land as much damage as I am sure he would have liked from mount, but he wins the round a clear 10-9. The second round is mainly a strike fest. Tony lands cleaner in my opinion and takes a 10-9 on my card. My biggest takeaway so far is just how much Tony is compensating for his deteriorating flexibility and mobility. Tony has always been unorthodox in his takedown defense, but he looks noticeably slower and more inflexible. Lee obviously was told that the right choice was to wrestle. He starts the third with a takedown attempt in the first 15 seconds. Let's study this takedown in detail as it is great foreshadowing for the Dariush fight. At 445, Tony throws a leg kick. Lee catches it and uses it to transition to a double leg attempt. Notice here at 443 that Lee is attempting to lock his hands beneath Tony's glutes while Tony fights back with his left arm attempting to underhook Kevin's right shoulder. At 441, Ferguson has that underhook locked in and overhooks the shoulder with his far arm into a gable grip. Tony is using that gable grip and positioning to put pressure on the body lock that Lee has locked in underneath the glutes. He is essentially trying to pull Lee upwards, which will put direct pressure on the grip Lee has on this sort of body lock. This sort of works in Kevin's favor as he is able to lift Tony off the ground with a little help from that force Ferguson is applying, and starts to attempt to illegally grab the fence. Once his underhook slips out, it is essentially a matter of time for Kevin to ground him, which he should do through a slam immediately. Kevin doesn't though, so Ferguson throws a power elbow just off center enough to not be illegal at 12-6, but it illegally lands to the back of Kevin's head. Kevin was not a fan of that and proceeds to complete the slam. Keep note of this one. Tony immediately locks in two butterfly hooks from underneath. These are great for lifting your opponent and initiating scrambles for either escapes or leg locks. So Ferguson is in a decent position here. Ferguson is locking down Kevin's head here at 434 to avoid him posturing up for strikes. Tony overhooks his left arm on Lee. Kevin immediately recognizes the danger because that overhook creates a fulcrum for Tony. In physics, a fulcrum is a point on which a lever, physics term for an object having rotational power applied linearly, think of pushing open a door in this example. The door is the lever, and the part where the door connects to the wall is the fulcrum. Fulcrums are key in jujitsu. What Tony can do from here is use those butterfly hooks to elevate Kevin's hips while locking down the shoulder with that overhook for a reversal straight into full mount. Bad outcome for Kevin. Kevin counters by gable gripping both hands on Tony's back at 428. This eliminates that fulcrum from before. Please note that I'm going so in depth with this because every inch of this is used by Dariush and Oliveira to win their fights. Tony has always been considered a prodigy on the ground. Losing six straight rounds by control grappling is a massive anomaly that needs explanation. But back to the sequence. Tony realizes he has lost his opportunity for the reversal, so he releases the overhooks and butterflies to regain his full guard. While Kevin maneuvers Tony to put his head and shoulders pressed in the corner of the mat and cage, like we can see here at 424. Tony starts reaching out for the cage, another note for our mind palace. What you are seeing is that Tony doesn't have an answer to what Kevin Lee's doing. Kevin has put Tony in a position that Tony is struggling to defend against, leaving him desperate for any leverage, which he tries to accomplish by grabbing the fence. But Lee makes a key mistake we can see most clearly at 417. He has relented on that control a bit, and Kevin has postured up, so his left knee is still on the mat but he's lifted his leg to press his right foot to the mat. Tony has a slight chance here, but Kevin's head position is blocking his view. Tony technically can try to fight for an underhook with his left arm, then grab the ankle of Kevin's right leg to pull himself out from that corner he is stuck in. This is a bit like those memes of the guy sitting on the couch covered in popcorn saying, jab more. So I'm showing this not to say, look at how dumb Tony is, but rather here is an exploitable opportunity that he could possibly get to. But unsurprisingly, he doesn't because he doesn't have slow-mo and multiple visual angles like I do. Now, at 401, Tony is setting up a triangle from the bottom 
which will foreshadow his eventual victory over Kevin. The issue currently, though, is that he has very little space for the triangle from the setup. But Kevin has given him the opportunity. He just needs the open mat space. At 355, another point of emphasis that Oliveira will use, and Benil to a lesser extent. Kevin postures full up on both feet, pressing all his weight down on Tony, pressing him further and further into the corner of that cage. Kevin's positioning allows for Tony to get both his feet on Lee's hips, and Tony power presses him off for a get-up. Again, add this one to the mind palace. Tony had an incredibly difficult time when pressured into that corner, especially when Kevin postured up so much. Tony created enough space to get feet on hips, but what if he hadn't? We'll have to wait and see. With that sequence done, let's sum up what we learned. Most importantly, Tony's grappling strategy relies upon open mat space. The best way to neutralize a ton of his grappling advantage is maneuvering him to the corner of the cage wall and mats. From there, he panics a bit, reaches for legal techniques like the fence grab to get up. Also, we can learn from Kevin's mistake. Posturing up is the correct defense to Tony's triangle setup, so Kevin was not strictly wrong there, but rather we need to defend against a triangle attempt earlier to keep ourselves in that semi-grounded position from 424, or a little less optimally at 417. Or we need to restrict the space so that Tony can't apply his feet on his opponent's hips to initiate the getup. But back to the action. Within 15 seconds of standing back up, Lee attempts a takedown again. I think that Tony's takedown defense, especially this one, is a great example of the stiffness I'm talking about. His defense isn't non-technical per se, but it looks very labored by Tony. The fast chain takedown makes it clear that Kevin realizes he has found something on the ground, but he needs to better set up his takedowns. At 2.35, we see Kevin set up with Tony in open stance. Tony attempts a looping uppercut that Kevin avoids, and shoots right into the same double leg we saw before. Very importantly though, remember that in the first one he did this, he had Tony backed up to the cage wall. This time, open mat for Tony to play with. Tony tries some of his usual tactics, but that grip that Kevin Lee has is too much, and he gets grounded center cage with 2 minutes and 30 seconds left in the third. At 2.26, we can see Tony is again setting up a triangle attempt, that he can use to either complete or use to create space for a getup. Kevin defends by removing the space between them, and at 2.23, Tony starts using the opportunity to land some nasty elbows. To try and stop the elbows coming his way, Kevin grabs Tony's head at 2.20. Tony locks that arm down and rotates for an armbar attempt. Tony gets it pretty deep as seen at 2.15. Tony takes it and gets halfway to a belly down armbar position. If Tony can rotate a bit further, it's probably the end of the fight right there. Kevin uses the opportunity to reposition, to defend the armbar, and release the tension on his elbow. At 206, Tony is trying to maneuver for an omoplata, which is a shoulder lock, that he again can finish or use to initiate a getup. So let's stop for a second to analyze again. What we are seeing is a key point for us to dive deep on. Tony's entire defensive grappling strategy relies upon initiating submission attempts to create space for getups. That's great and highly effective, but as we saw in the last grounded sequence, he has a specific Achilles heel against the fence. Pressing him into the corner of the mat and cage wall eliminates the space needed to initiate those submissions to escape. Without that space, Tony lacks some of the fundamental grappling skills necessary to make that space. Going frame by frame more won't really add to our analysis. The most important takeaway is to really notice the difference between how active Tony is with open mat space and how stuck he is against the fence when those skills fail him. Tony continues to chain submissions until 105 when he is fully locked in a triangle that will eventually submit Kevin Lee. And I won't lie to you guys, with all that we know that happens going forward, I honestly cried watching him win that belt, seeing the reaction he had laying on the ground crying himself. He has really fought through a lot to get to this point, and it's sad that this fight, which is the pinnacle of his professional career, sowed, in my opinion, all the seeds for his losses to Oliver and Darius. As I said before, Pettis and Cowboy fights don't teach us much, so let's quickly cover them and move on. The Pettis fight is not a good visual to prove the point due to the way that Pettis is fighting it. He is sort of fighting like Barboza, but much more one-dimensionally. He's constantly on his bike, exiting the pocket, and looking for an opportunity to plant and throw a power to. Fight ends with him breaking his hand and being unable to continue. This fight marks the essential end of Cowboy's career in the UFC and starts off his lost streak until his retirement. His skills are still there, but his athleticism is leaving, and his chin is for sure showing serious signs of decay. Again, this one ends in injury, but it's a fun fight if interested. But now comes the hard part. I'm going to break down the complete falloff of Tony's career into two sections. Striking with Gaethje, and grappling with Dariush and Oliveira. Let's start with Gaethje, then move into the other two. Alright, 
It's important for us here to succinctly summarize the mounds of context I have thrown at you before we talk about Justin. First, let's list the issues we have seen out of Ferguson so far that are most important to understanding his decline from a striking perspective. First, Tony's strike defense fundamentals are poor. Many fighters fight with low hands, so I can't critique that. However, I will critique his poor use of high guards in situations where he obviously needs to leverage one. Eating head and body kicks on the hands slash wrist or absorbing the impact to grab the limb in the case of body kicks. This is most notable when he is fighting out of open stance like his fight with RDA where his body was getting shredded by those body kicks. In some ways these are unavoidable, but there are ways to mitigate the damage much better than the way he is approaching this. Building off that first point is a sub point, his hanging chin. From the very start of Tony's career, he has hung his chin in the pocket with the aforementioned bad strike D fundamentals, leaving it open for any brave soul willing to bite down on the mouthpiece and rip hooks back at it. We have seen multiple occasions where these have landed, like against Kevin Lee, RDA, Edson Barbosa, and Michael Johnson. None have put the lights out entirely, but with enough power, it is certainly possible. The second point, probably the most important, is his abysmal footwork. This comes in three sub-varieties, terrible pocket exit footwork, below average pressure offensive footwork, and his tendency to get turned around in the pocket. Tony lacks any coherent ability to effectively maintain range aside from front kicks, teep kicks, and through sheer violence, forcing opponents to escape themselves. When Tony has to exit the pocket, he generally does it by stance switching backwards, like I'm showing on screen now. This is not good for a couple reasons. It opens him up to leg kicks, it opens him up to counters, which are exacerbated by his hanging chin, and it eliminates a lot of Tony's ability to throw power counters back since he is off balance. The other main mode that this second point shows up is his terrible tendency to turn his back to his opponent while still in the pocket. We see this occur generally in two situations. First is when he overthrows his strikes, generally his hook. Second is when he eats a power leg kick while off balance and uses the momentum to try and spin himself back into position. No one has attacked this specific problem the best way I think they should, which is the Aljamain Sterling vs. Piotr Jan 2 strategy of power back takes. Most opponents try to land hooks to the back turned Ferguson, like the examples on screen. To quickly sum up these points, Tony does not relent nor shy away from pain or damage ever. Every flaw I have just identified falls into this category and reminds me of the video from Jocko Willink titled Good. If you haven't seen it, check it out, I have it in the description. Throw leg kicks at me and I don't check them? Good. Pain is an illusion. Check my leg kicks? Good. This is why I kick metal poles for shin conditioning. Land damage on my chin because it's open? Good. My chin is stronger than yours. And finally, our third point. RDA has written the book on how to avoid the massive visceral damage of his elbows. Drop your high guard, lean out, back pedal from the pocket. But one fact remains. Up until Gaethje, no one put it all together. Tony was able to fight through all of these deficiencies and put together a truly incredible win streak. Like I said in the fall section, injuries are what I believe turns that tide. Degradation in his knees reduces his flexibility and speed with which he can exit or lean out of the pocket. He always relied upon his athleticism to avoid strikes, but it's failing him steadily and then all at once. I can't tell if he also has hip or back issues on top of his knees being blown, but he is noticeably more stiff against Lee and all fights after, which limits his leaning ability. That was the entire basis for the success, or more aptly, lack of failure of his hanging chin. As his knees go, his checking gets worse and worse to the point of just eating leg kicks, or he lifts his leg. That leads him to getting turned around more and more, or leveled occasionally. So, we have listed our three main deficiencies. We have analyzed how it worked for so long, and projected that the problem was likely due to injuries piling up, and shrinking his ability to athletically overcome these deficiencies. The next part can sound very Monday morning quarterbacky, but I'll try to be as objective as possible to identify how I would attack a diminished Tony prior to the Gaethje fight. The main ways I identify are throw long twos where he telegraphs the leg kicks, loop hooks when he throws his uppercuts in order to land on his exposed chin, leg kick him, preferably behind the two you are already using to counter his leg kick, to diminish his athleticism further and widen the window you have to land on his chin when he tries to exit the pocket. Most importantly, Ferguson fights wars of attrition. We have seen his chin damaged, but he has rarely been in true danger of a knockout. Beating Ferguson will likely be a decision-based war of attrition, but we need it to be in our favor. Avoid his elbows and his looping uppercuts. Counter his entries with the methods I have outlined, and begin to fire back once his leg is damaged and his chin has taken some hits from the counter twos. If he turns his back, 
jump on the back take, even if he Granby rolls out of it. Take the opportunity if it's there. Like we saw with Kevin Lee, if you grapple with him technically and methodically, there could be openings. So, now it is time to see how Gaethje did it. Does he take my advice? What does he see that I missed? It's important to note that this fight got pushed due to COVID issues, and Gaethje couldn't make 155 on such short notice. So to prove a point, Tony cut weight for the original fight date to show his commitment. I would argue this was a dumb choice, as weight cuts are not healthy, and really only served his ego at the expense of his health. Before we break down the fight further, I want to quickly remind the audience of the four main striking orientations with visual examples. Open versus closed stance refers to the orientation of one fighter in opposition to the other. Open stance is when one fighter is in orthodox and one is in southpaw. Closed stance is when both fighters are in the same stance. Orthodox is lead hand left, southpaw lead hand right. So now to fight analysis. We begin in the first round. Gaethje is doing a really good job of maintaining range early. That's what stands out right off the bat to me. At 354, Justin throws a leg kick that Tony checks. Tony counters back with a lead hook that Gaethje slips and nearly smashes him on his hanging chin. This will come to be Gaethje's main counter from close stance, but he needs to lock in the timing and precision to really make Tony pay. 334, another leg kick entry that Tony counters, this time with a lead uppercut. Justin dips and rips a lead hook that hits the back of Tony's head. Imprecise, but the opportunity is there. Further reinforcement that this is the chosen combo by Gaethje and his camp. These sequences overwhelmingly show that Gaethje has seen the tape of the hanging chin and has strategies, namely the lead hook from close stance to counter and land with power. At 319 in the first, Gaethje counters a low kick with a two, but he's out of range, so he gets debased by Tony. At three minutes of the first, we see Gaethje land the first of the lead hooks to Tony when he overthrows and turns his back. So we have a binary point to really hit home here. First, what will Gaethje do if Tony fights him from open stance? Secondly, Gaethje needs to attack leg kicks such that Ferguson holds firm in his close stance. The main way to do this is a strike he has already attempted, the switch kick to Tony's lead leg from open stance to try and force Tony into a close stance more. By doing damage to the lead leg, Tony will have to stick to close stance to protect that damaged leg. Gaethje has already shown he just needs to improve his timing to land his lead hook from close stance with devastating power to that outstretched chin. All Gaethje needs to do is get more opportunities for that strike. At 237, Gaethje is baiting Tony to go first so he can roll and rip that lead hook to the chin. Gaethje way overpowers it and sends that fist into the nosebleeds. If Gaethje can get the timing down and not overthrow, it's a problem for Ferguson. 229, another leg kick entry, roll, reset, power lead hook. This has been said by Dan Hardy, so I'm not treading new ground here, but the fascinating way that Gaethje resets his stance of these leg kicks perfectly sets him up to defend counters and throw back with his own strikes. He is rotating his base on his way back, resetting his foot, such that he has now taken a new angle that Tony doesn't have the footwork to combat, leaving him completely bladed, meaning flat and unprotected. So he may eat the power lead hook with full damage. I want to pause now as we are halfway through the first. If you had given me this tape without me knowing what happens and let me do slow-mo and such so I can break it down the way I am, I would tell you Gaethje finishes Tony with a lead hook by the end of the second. The fact that Tony survives to the fifth is a testament to his grit for better or worse. 208. Gaethje slips outside on an open stance jab from Tony. Aljo is using this to take the back, but Gaethje is not Aljo. Something I notice with Gaethje is on those resets, he will often use a pitter-patter rear hook to kind of load his hips for the power lead hook. What I mean by this is he's throwing sort of a hidden, fainted rear hook to the body and then ripping the lead hook behind it. At 123, Gaethje really baits Tony into his bad step through footwork and rips a two back on a stance switch. It glances, but it is the first evidence so far of his strategy to combating Ferguson from open stance. At 49 seconds, we see him do it again, which makes me think that this is indeed the strategy they are planning to take. Tony throws a power uppercut and steps through. Gaethje slips and rips the two down the pipe while angling off. I think that's enough of stopping and starting. As this round goes, it's sort of the same sequence over and over. It's a basic if-then sequence. If Tony is fighting out a close stance with Gaethje, enter with a leg kick, angle off, feint a hook to the body, rip the lead hook upstairs, rinse and repeat. From open stance, bait Tony to enter without feigning, slip outside or dip low, rip a power straight down the middle on Tony's hanging chin. So let's head to the second round and see how Tony adapts to this binary. 
Unfortunately for Tony, it continues much the same as the first. Gaethje has the reads, but is imprecise and overthrowing his punches to begin the round. At 441, Tony adapts to the main open stance strategy Justin is employing. Tony throws a pawing jab. Gaethje dips it, rips a right hand, and Tony himself slips that. Tony is learning on the fly. It's important for us to pause here and mention that for all I've talked about him being sort of a non-technical fighter, his adaptations are truly what keep him afloat, even as his athleticism is fading. For all his just bleed type shenanigans, Tony is a smart fighter and he can make in-fight adaptations even with his less than stellar corner featuring Eddie Bravo for some reason. But adaptations are only a band-aid to the major holes in his striking defense. Gaethje proceeds to reset his foot perfectly, while Tony uses a non-technical exit and eats a power overhand left from Gaethje. Like I said, he is adapting, but he can't get past that footwork limitation. 404. Gaethje misses on a 2. Stance switches through to an overhand left that lands clean on Ferguson. Ferguson's pocket exit footwork again fails him here. This creates a situation I hadn't thought of, which is to use step-through stance switch strikes to increase the power of the lands on Ferguson's open chin. See, I am not a Monday morning quarterback. I do these sequentially, so the strategy I outlined was actually me not having watched the Gaethje fight. At 343, Gaethje is able to get the timing down to land twos from close stance now, in addition to his open stance twos. This is a bad sign for Ferguson, who eats this one clean. Gaethje is starting to gain that timing that is essential to beating Ferguson. Strikes are landing square, but Ferguson doesn't seem affected by them yet. 149 of the second gives us another look at those bad turnarounds. Ferguson feints a jab into a rear uppercut. Gaethje parries. Ferguson swings his lead hand back to try and power up the uppercut, leaving his chin hanging wide. Gaethje uses the parrying hand to land a power to the side of Ferg's head, then follows it up with a lead hook that lands cleanly. Ferguson spins through it, but Ferguson's nose begins immediately leaking after that one. The leg kick at 109 really seems to have hobbled Ferguson's left leg. Tony's noticeably light on it after this, and I notice his footwork is degrading more and more, becoming more stiff after this point, indicating the damage is taking a toll. That leg kick feels like a major inflection point in this fight, though Tony won't go gently into that good night. Ferg's jab and uppercut are doing a number on Gaethje's nose and mouth. The round ends with Ferg dropping Gaethje with a power uppercut that Tony mercifully didn't pounce on due to the ending bell. Gaethje's mouth is bloody heading into this round. Ferg is taking a toll on him damage-wise. Gaethje again punishes the lazy stance switch walk-in with a power two on the jaw at 440 of the third, which really stuck Ferguson. Tony seems content to fight outside with his jab for a bit. I think he is really starting to feel the damage of Gaethje more now. The sequence sort of reminds me of the jab RDA landed that had Tony fight outside for a bit while he recovered. 427 is a good sequence to highlight the bad technical striking fundamentals of Tony. Gaethje throws one of my favorite combos. Rear hook to the body, then a lead hook upstairs to the head. Rear hook is used to drop the hands and try and open up the chin for the lead hook. That's just boxing 101 right there. Ferguson blocks it, but he's just stapling his arms to his chest to try and cover both, which is not a technical defense by any means. Tony is now lifting his lead foot on every leg kick to the left leg, making me think my analysis is correct, that the earlier leg kick has shot that leg. Tony is also initiating from further distances out of fear of the counter leg kick on entry from close stance. Let's stop quick to analyze the binary and lock in why this is bad for Tony. Tony has two options. Use technical footwork entries to initiate strikes and eat a leg kick on the already highly damaged lead leg. Or use unorthodox entries like Superman jabs and more often than not, eat the power two in return. Tony's third option is to lock into southpaw and fight Gaethje universally out of southpaw to avoid the binary, but Ferguson has always functioned best out of orthodox. This actually works to Gaethje's disadvantage because Gaethje has so far been much more effective countering Tony from close stance. Stephen A. Smith also chimes in to pretend he knows MMA, incorrectly referring to Justin as Garth. The sequence at 355, I believe, is the complete inflection point for this fight. Garth, I mean Gaethje, has locked in his counter hook to Ferguson from close stance and the tide has turned dominantly in Gaethje's favor from this orientation. Ferg feints a jab, throws a two that Gaethje slips into a power leg kick that lands square on that shot left leg. Tony's knee buckles. Gaethje uses the backswing to reset, while Tony tries to land some damage back while standing straight up in his now bladed stance. Gaethje swings a power lead hook that lands square on Tony's nose. Tony plays it off, but Gaethje has locked in the power and the timing of that counter. Ferguson needs to adapt fast to survive. Tony tries to immediately get one back by doing his now telegraph step through uppercut from open stance. Gaethje makes him pay with a two that again lands square on Ferguson's unguarded face. Seconds earlier, he locked in the timing of the close stance counter, 
Now he has the open stance counter locked and loaded. To me, looking back, this is the end of the fight. It becomes more a question of how long Tony can last unless he makes serious adaptations to his strategy. Surprisingly, Tony has not once attempted a step and grab elbow. I actually think this is the tactic he needed to use against Gaethje to turn the tide of the fight back in his favor. The solution to the tactic is out there, but if Gaethje makes a mistake and Ferguson lands one, it could absolutely regain him momentum in a major way. At 258, Ferguson tries changing things up with the tactic I mentioned earlier, the fainted Superman punch entry. Gaethje again reads and slams the two on the throat slash lower chin of Ferguson. At 244, Gaethje finally cracks Ferguson's chin with the open stance two counter. Ferguson just is never able to turn the tide, and instead of going sequence by sequence, slowly watching him get picked apart in one of the hardest to watch TKOs I've ever seen, I'm just going to head to the analysis section. So what did we learn? Gaethje's strategy is actually pretty specific to him, and is not super replicable, except by, say, a Dustin Poirier type fighter. Ferguson's striking game plan across his career has adaptable elements, but in the end, he is a flow state striker. When you get stunned and take damage to the brain as a flow state striker, you lose a lot of benefits of the style. If you are stunned, you can't think as well, and thus can't read and react the way you used to. Tony doesn't have the muscle memory of set combos like a 3-2 to fall back on when his brain is scrambled. Also, it's important to note that contrary to popular belief, chins do not heal. I talked about this in my serial video some, so check that out if you want to learn more. Simply, it's not a muscle that can be strengthened, it is a single-use battery. When it's gone, it's gone. Gaethje has taken Ferguson's granite chin from him, and it will not come back, unfortunately. This leaves us a bit on a sour note, but we need to finish off our full career analysis section by dissecting his overall grappling game with specific breakdowns of his fights versus Oliveira and Dariush before we can get to the discussion and conclusion sections. Okay, so we now have a full understanding top to bottom of Tony's striking development and eventual regression. Like with striking, let's summarize the key issues we have identified in his career up until these fights to see how Benil and Oliveira individually dismantle Tony. So for starters, he has not kept up with the modern MMA grappling meta. He is very bad at defending takedowns against the fence. For a not-so-brief tangent, grappling in MMA has advanced a ton. Hoist Gracie comes into UFC 1 and murks everyone, basically establishing that jiu-jitsu is an extremely dominant form of martial arts. It takes years, but fighters begin to learn more and more how to practice Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but most importantly how to combat it, namely grounded pound damage. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu doesn't really have an answer to this outcome. It's hard to submit someone from bottom when they're raining power elbows on your face, right? In comes a true grappling pioneer in Eddie Bravo. I need to make sure I give Bravo his flowers now because I'm going to shred him in a couple minutes. Eddie Bravo is the founder of 10th Planet Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. For those that do not know, he is the father of a system of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that is built expressly to counter the effect of ground and pound in Jiu-Jitsu. The utilization of mission control, as 10th Planet practitioners call it, is built in a way that eliminates the ability to posture up and land damage from top position. 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu also is practiced without the use of a gi, as more MMA fighters began to compete without the gi and in the more traditional garb we see today. Eddie created a truly revolutionary system and goes on to defeat the legendary Jiu-Jitsu ace, Hoyler Gracie. This match was essentially the changing of the guard, and thus the split between gi and no gi jiu-jitsu began. Genius grapplers like John Donaher took the reins from Bravo and built their own styles of no gi jiu-jitsu and brought that to MMA. For those that do not know, John Donaher was George St. Pierre's grappling coach. Unfortunately, Eddie Bravo's 10th planet system, in my opinion and analysis, has stagnated, and only one big name fighter is a true practitioner of just, I say again with emphasis, just, that style of jiu-jitsu in the UFC currently, that fighter, Tony Ferguson. Unfortunately, like Gracie Jiu-Jitsu before Bravo, Bravo's system has stagnated due to the lack of incorporation of a key element of MMA, the cage wall. Smart grappling minds realize just how incredibly important the cage wall is to grappling. Habib Nurmagomedov created one of the most dominant styles of grappling in the history of MMA by leveraging it. Unfortunately for Ferguson, his over-reliance on Bravo's system created a major hole in this game. Tony's entire grappling system is reliant entirely on open mat wrestling with cage space. Even more specifically, his grappling defense is completely predicated on submission attempts and creating scrambles. If they fail, he doesn't maintain his technique enough to initiate technical getups. Thus enters what I have called the Eddie Bravo problem. Tony is lost when opponents use the cage as a grappling technique, both when defending takedowns as well as when maintaining top control. As such, he is the ultimate 10th planet success and failure story. 
When Tony submitted Kevin Lee, he got his 10th Planet Black Belt from Eddie Bravo himself. As I have now said indirectly, but I repeat it now directly, Bravo has become a dinosaur in modern MMA, and Tony never moved past his methods. That Kevin Lee fight showed us this. When Kevin used the cage to take down and control Tony, he had the most success we have ever seen against Ferguson in his entire career. When he got taken down on the open mat, however, Ferguson chained submissions together until one stuck and he won that fight. But a question remains, where does Charles Oliveira fit into all this? Coming off the loss to Gaethje, the question on everyone's mind was, was it a one-time thing or can he bounce back? Oliveira unfortunately put that to rest. At 3.40 of the first, Oliveira slips a lead elbow for a double leg attempt and wraps a body lock on Tony's waist. He pushes Tony to the fence, and at 3.38, we see the issues with cage takedown defense I alluded to earlier. Ferguson needs to plant his right foot firmly to the corner of the cage wall and mat. He can then use the fence as a third leg to defend the takedown and break the body lock. Instead, at 3.37, he uses that leg to sort of create space by leaning it on Oliveira's thigh and hops on his left leg, which is abysmal takedown defense if we are honest with ourselves. Olive lifts and slams Tony near the cage, but not against it. Tony recognizes the need to move away from the cage and tries to shrimp away. Tony is still adapting to his flaws. We can't fault him there. Charles counters by locking in a cradle on Tony, as seen at 322. Notice at 320 that Charles has his right hand on Tony's ankle, adding even greater control to this position. Charles uses that ankle control to try and mount Tony, who effectively defends. And Charles ends up in half-guard-like position. Tony has one butterfly hook on the far hip. Notice that Charles is grapevining the other leg, which gives him a ton of control. A great image of the grapevine comes at 259. This is locking that leg down so that Tony can't get his intended other butterfly hook that he wants so he can elevate Charles and make space for sub slash get up strategy. Now, one thing to mention here is that Charles has identified an opportunity that I never realized until now. That grapevine nullifies Tony's open mat defenses, which are built around elevating with butterfly hooks. All without the need of the cage wall, Oliveira has shut down his game. If he can lock in a second one, he has complete control of Tony to do with what he likes. At 237, Charles uses the great find to create leverage to free his other leg in an attempt to mount Tony. Once Charles starts getting that knee across at 234, Tony correctly bridges to try and reverse Charles. As we can see at 232, Charles' balance is too strong, and Tony has nearly given up his back in his attempt to reverse him. Tony rotates back, and Charles gets the mount at 225. Charles is grappling like a boa constrictor. He's leaving no space for Tony and is not aggressively chasing strikes or submissions. He is purely advancing position by position, more advantage by the minute. At 208, Charles has both of Tony's legs grapevined, and he is in near total control. Charles maintains this crazy control until 10 seconds left, when Tony gives up his left arm and Charles pounces on a beautiful armbar that absolutely destroys Tony's elbow. Tony refuses to tap out of some mix of ego, spite, and will. The round ends in earnest. Instead of going moment by moment for the second and third, I will give high level details as the writing is sort of on the wall for a now injured Tony who is obviously outmatched by a much superior grappling opponent. Tony's elbow is absolutely shot, and unfortunately that is the arm where he derives a majority of his striking power in the form of his lead uppercut from Orthodox. If that wasn't enough, Oliveira's nogi jiu-jitsu is just completely superior to Ferguson's outmoded 10th planet system. At 408 of the second, Charles catches a kick and single legs Tony to the mat. Pressed between the cage wall and the floor, Tony is in trouble. Tony illegally upkicks, leading to a stoppage. But really it's progressing rapidly downhill for Tony as Oliveira is maintaining complete control, content to advance position and maintain control to another winning round. Again at 408, which is pretty crazy. This time in the third round, Charles catches another kick and throws Tony to the fence. He locks in the body lock under the glute, just like Lee did at 405. He again rides out control to finish up three rounds to nil on Tony. The nail is in the coffin now. It's obvious that Tony has been passed by the lightweight elite in both striking and grappling. The outmoded 10th planet system and his lack of evolution within the MMA grappling meta to use the fence as a system of defense have stripped Tony of his ground-based dynamism. The question is now, can he hang with the contender class of fighters like Dariush, who are hyper-talented but not on the full title radar like Oliveira and Gaethje are? So let's get right into Dariush. To avoid going too long on this video, let's just break down the first and half of the second in detail and then generalize the rest. For those unfamiliar with Benil, I did a video on him prior to this fight, which you can watch. But simply, he is a fantastic freestyle wrestler who was something of a prodigy in no-gi jiu-jitsu before making the full switch to MMA. 
Benil uses a mix of pressure dirty boxing to back up Ferguson and try and initiate grappling situations with him. It's pretty crazy in hindsight to watch Benil Dariush pressuring the life out of Tony Ferguson after spending hours and hours watching Tony walk down RDA, Edson Barbosa, and Josh Thompson. Benil finally gets his opportunity at 341 and shoots a double leg. He transitions to the body lock below the glutes at 338 and pulls the chair out from beneath Ferguson. Ferguson plays it right and gets himself some space to work with by turning around with Benil. Tony again lands what is now his third career illegal upkick. First Edson, then Oliveira, now my boy Benny at 328 with a clear grounded knee. It isn't called, but it should have been. At 105, we see that Benil has learned from the Oliveira second round tape. Benil continues to ride out control in the first, content to defend against the submissions he sees Telegraph coming his way by Ferguson. First round ends with Tony being fully controlled from takedown to bell. At 437 of the second, we see Benil use the same takedown as before, double leg in a body lock below the glutes. Tony drops his level and ends up in a seated position trying to defend. Tony is essentially just out of answers for the specific strategic sequence now employed by Benil after seeing it from both Oliveira and Lee. Benil maintains control until Ferguson is able to get up at 201. Benil again wraps the same double leg with body lock under the glutes. Tony tries to Granby roll to initiate a scramble or escape, but Benil holds on. Benil overcommits on an outside trip soon after and ends up underneath Ferguson. Benil uses the opportunity to immediately initiate a scramble for the 50-50 position at 153. Tony doesn't have much of an answer, and at 138, Benil has it locked in. Like Oliveira's armbar before, and easily the most sad moment for me in this entire analysis, Benil locks in the ankle lock and proceeds to destroy whatever ligaments and cartilage are left in Tony's left knee. Again, some mix of spite, ego, and will keep him from tapping. Honestly, at this point, I am done. Benil wins this on the scorecards, three rounds to nil. Let's just analyze and move on. Benil is an incredibly talented fighter, but less so than Oliveira in the grappling realm. Benil, to me, is a greater indictment of Tony's limited growth than Oliveira turned out to be. The fact that Oliveira never finished Tony is a miracle, considering Oliveira has finished Chandler, Poirier, and Gaethje, and route to vying to unseat Habib as the greatest lightweight champion in history. Benil showed more to me in his ability to finish the same double leg to body lag takedown that Ferguson has fallen victim to in two previous fights. Oliveira showed how to limit Tony's dynamism in his scramble attempts, whereas Benil showed just how little Tony's grappling has kept up with the modern times. It is now time to lay this story to rest and discuss what we have learned succinctly and answer the titular question. Could Tony have avoided this fate? In the end, Tony's decline was due to specific areas in striking and grappling. In striking, first, Tony's strike defensive fundamentals are poor and never improved. Unfortunately, the toll injuries took on him led to further regression of his ability to compensate with athleticism to override these fundamental issues. Building off that first, he hangs his chin in the pocket when pressured. The second point, and probably the most important, is his abysmal footwork. Tony lacks any coherent ability to effectively maintain range aside from front kicks, teeps, and sheer violence, forcing opponents to escape themselves. As injuries mounted, his constantly poor defensive footwork couldn't be compensated for anymore and that window to hit Tony and hit him hard expanded even further until Gaethje cracked his chin and ended the attrition style Tony used to win striking victories. Moving on to grappling, Kevin Lee wrote the blueprint for how to effectively take down and control Ferguson. Oliveira used more advanced no-gi practices combined with his savant-like balance talents to quasi-submit by armbar and control Tony to decision. Benil used the takedown blueprint that Kevin Lee showed on top of the use of the cage wall to control Ferguson's scrambles submission attempts, and leave him a shell on the ground. So with the issues identified and plainly spoken, could he have fixed them? I would say yes to some. Tony certainly could have improved his striking fundamentals, so that when his athleticism faded, he would not have gotten cracked as hard by Gaethje. But in the end, I think this was incredibly unlikely. The reason Tony rose to such heights was that he created an unorthodox strategy to compensate for his natural inclination to strike that way. Asking him to then utilize more orthodox striking styles would be like telling Habib he just need to go to Thailand for a bit and he'll come back a striker as good as Adesanya. It's just not realistic. Tony's striking deficiencies were dyed in the wool in my opinion, unfortunately. However, his grappling was absolutely fixable, but akin to his unorthodox mindset when it came to striking, so too did his grappling. Tony joined up with Bravo as two like-minded, eccentric martial artists. Their bond is obviously greater than master and student, but that of close friends. Had he left Bravo and begun training with Donaher or others, 
Tony absolutely could have beaten Benil in my opinion, but would have likely not been able to overcome the savant-like abilities of Oliveira due to the mounting injuries he has sustained. So to answer the question succinctly, could he have avoided this fate? I honestly don't think so. The traits that made him the Darce Knight ultimately led to his regression. In the end, Tony Ferguson is an illusion wrapped in an enigma. I feel very comfortable saying that there will never be someone like him ever again in MMA. The whole package is really just not replicable. His striking strategic changes perfectly coincided with the changing meta of MMA, and he rode that to one of the longest winning streaks in UFC history. Tony's grappling also coincided with the development of Nogi Jiu-Jitsu, and cage grappling in parallel with his rise. After Kevin Lee, his loss to a fighter like Benil was set in stone, as the UFC around him improved where he stagnated. This also begs the all-important question, would he have beaten Habib? I choose not to answer that question. I have my opinion, and I think my analysis speaks for itself. But if you've learned anything from my analysis of Tony, it's that at every turn where it seemed logical for him to fall off, whether it be skill improvements or injuries, Tony found a way through grit, determination, and distilled force of will. So why put a binary yes-no to a question that is honestly more fascinating to just leave open? And that's how I want to end this analysis. Tony Ferguson overcame all obstacles in his way until his body and evolution failed him. Even then, his will never broke. He ate that armbar and fought two more rounds against one of the greatest lightweights in history. Even then, his will never broke. Then he blew his knee in every way possible and fought another round on it. Even then, his will never broke. Tony Ferguson may not end his career as a champion, but he is truly a legend of the sport in every sense of the concept. Conor McGregor may have brought in more fans, but he is more accurately a prize fighter, not really an MMA fighter. Tony Ferguson is MMA, distilled down to its very essence, warts and all, and he will live on in fans' memories, the last of a certain breed of MMA heroes. He is not the hero MMA deserved, but the hero MMA needed. He was the Darce Knight.